It's good, right? All right, I hate to be the one to bring everyone back together after lunch, but uh, we are going to go ahead and get started early for our career development Q&A. So with that, I would like to introduce our facilitator, Dr. Stacey Tannenbaum. She is currently the VP of Scientific Engagement at Metrum Research Group. She's also a fellow of the International Society of Pharmacometrics, as well as the Executive Committee Chair for the World Conference of Pharmacometrics. Building up to this, she had significant worldwide impact on modeling and simulation through her co-founding of the International Society of Pharmacometrics and the American Conference on Pharma Pharmacometrics. So please, let's give it to Dr. Stacey Tannenbaum to lead our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you for the nice introduction. Very excited to have this panel of very important people up here who are going to help with some career development advice. So we had a lot of great questions that have come through. I know Sarah put a call out to some of our trainees asking for questions. A lot of them were very technical. We're going to focus today on more the career development specifics, more about jobs, finding jobs, what are the skills that we're looking for, and some of our career development paths as well. Now, I'm going to be the bad guy because part of the reason we're up here is we all like to talk a lot. And so I'm going to be the person to certain people on the panel. And, I, and I'll do this. And I will cut, I will cut you off. <laughs> so I'd ask all of our panelists to keep their answers short and sweet. Now, we have a number of questions that came through, but I think it's a lot better if we can be more interactive. So I'm going to start with a couple of the seed questions that came through, but then I really want to ask the trainees what kind of advice that you're looking for. Um, so we'll have somebody uh, running around with a mic to ask some of the questions. I'm also going to be sort of semi part of the panel, but I, I really want to make sure that our folks have an opportunity to introduce themselves. And so I want to start with the introduction. Uh, uh, I've already been introduced, so thank you very much. I'm Stacey Tannenbaum, I'm the VP of Scientific Engagement at Metrum Research Group. And I wanted everybody to share their first job, not their first professional job, their first job. My first job was in high school. I worked in an eye lab making eyeglasses. So when people tell you that, oh, we can make your glasses in an hour, you can make glasses in 15 minutes. So I'm just letting you know that. So don't believe the hype. And so I'm going to then pass to each of my panelists briefly briefly to introduce themselves and also tell us about their first jobs. Yeah, so my name is Stefan Schmidt. Uh, I'm currently an endowedful professor at the University of Florida. We also serve as the director for the Center for Pharmacometrics and Systems Pharmacology. Um, my uh, first job was um, I was working with my dad. He was a plumber. And so when I was in, in high school, you know, lifting around radiators and, you know, you know, digging through ceilings with like a hammer and a chisel. So I figured out, you know, very quickly that, you know, it's better to work with your head than with your back. And that was my first job, you know, worked as, you know, tour guide, you know, was in, had actually my first plumbing business together with him. Um, so I'm probably the first, you know, B farm PhD with a plumbing license that I ever meet. Um, but, you know, that's besides the point. So career advice, um, you know, pick your seat wisely. Don't take the first one. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Matangi Gopalakrishnan. I'm a faculty at University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. I'm also the director for the online master's program in pharmacometrics uh, at UMB. Um, my first job uh, was during my undergraduate years. I was a tutor. I was um, I was considered a studious person, so I chose probably tutoring as one of my first jobs. So I was tutoring elementary school kids in their math and science, so that was my first job. So I'll be brief. <clears throat> My name is Lanny, uh, currently vice president in the Lilly PKPD organization, focused on the science. Um, my first job, a paid job, <clears throat> probably is a research assistant or teaching assistant in the university while pursuing a PhD degree, as many of you are. Um, but in terms of a career, I've been with Lilly for 28 plus years. And uh, career, I have on both sides as a scientific contrib individual contributor, as well as management uh, leading the Lilly PKPD organization. So we can share more about that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sven Menzing. I'm senior director and head of pharmacometrics at Epi, located in Germany. And my first job was, I didn't go to the army, which was mandatory at the time, but I did civil service for 13 months, working in a radiology department in a hospital, making those um, lead protections that your lung doesn't get radiated, but all the rest of the tumor. And yeah, did this for 13 years and then went to university. 
Okay. It's... Okay. So yeah, my name is Nieves. Uh, I'm a pure pharmacometrician. I'm a modeler, and pharmacometrics is my passion. And currently, I'm working in Gilead. But before that, I was assistant professor in IUPUI. Then uh, I work in Eli Lilly, then Metro, and now Gilead. And regarding your question, um, there is not a very short answer, but <laughs> Okay, so I was something that is called in Spanish, I'm from Spain, by the way, uh, it's called Cabezudo. So during the festival of the city, that is once a year, um, I used to wear a very big, big head that it was very, very heavy. And then we carry a cow bladder, like a dried cow bladder, chasing kids and kicking <laughs> kids. And they, they paid me for that. So this was my first my first job. I sorry. Well, I just learned some new things today. <laughs> the purpose obviously of asking this question is we don't always continue on our first career path. And I think, you know, a lot of people, especially trainees, are thinking about their first job and they're concerned about their first job, making the right choice. What if it's not the right choice? How long do I have to stay there? What do I need to do? How am I gonna get that job? And so what I wanted to show you is some of us have started in careers and in first jobs that are relevant to our career. Uh, I also was typing in the card catalog, so <laughs> aging myself, uh, at, in college. That was my job, typing cards into the computer. We've all started in different paths, and we've all found our paths on our way here. And sometimes it's circuitous, and sometimes it's direct. Um, and I just want people to understand that. And I thought, you know, it's a nice way to see where we all started is not necessarily where we all ended up. Um, and so I want to try to take some of the angst away from that first job discussion. And I hope that that helped a little bit. Actually, I think my first job is uh, working in a hospital as clinical pharmacist. So. Excellent. So we have a number of questions. I think what I want to do is just maybe go straight to Q&A. We really want to hear from you what are questions that you have for this panel? And I would like to suggest again, let's keep that sort of away from the technical questions because we're gonna have lots and lots of opportunities to talk about technical. Um, we're also all gonna be here. Is everyone here all three days of the conference? Yeah, we're all here all three days of the conference. So if you wanna dig in a little bit to some of these, we're all gonna be here and really happy to talk to any of you uh, on the breaks as well. So Jess, if you want, uh, you have a mic. Does anyone have any questions for the panel? Don't be shy. This is your opportunity. Maria. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So when I was finishing my PhD, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to go to academia or industry. So how did you all decide where to go after you finished school? Great question. Um, I can start. I was going to academia. That was my plan when I graduated from graduate school. I had taken teaching classes. I went to do my postdoc and I got the opportunity to go and do some projects with industry. And I said, ooh, <laughs> you don't have to write a grant and you still get to do fun, cool stuff. But I know that there's a lot more to it than that. I thought that industry was you have all the money, but you are limited in what you can do. And academia was you have to fight for the money, but you can do anything you want. And I think our folks here on the panel can probably tell you that neither one of those is completely true. There's some aspects to that. I ended up going into industry, but I get my, my teaching bug done by working with academic programs and things like that. But I'll ask some of our folks here kind of what was your... I think it's a great question. Uh, I mean, in general, I've always been like a big fan of doing internships um, because, you know, that gives you like a feeling of what to expect at least from a certain area. And I've seen, you know, many cases, um, you know, including my wife, uh, she, you know, is a speech pathologist by her first training and she really likes the concept of language, but, you know, she doesn't like the clinical practice of it. And so I guess, you know, if you go into like an internship, then you can, you know, feel it out and, you know, see what this is about. And that's what I did at the end of my PhD. I was on the fence between um, industry um, and uh, academia. And uh, so I did an internship at pharma company uh, over the summer and um, they offered me a job afterwards and I said I didn't really like it it's like you're the first in who had ever turned that down it's like yeah sorry but you know I, I think I really want to go into academia and then you know um, 
decided to do a postdoc um, as the next step and uh, basically de-risking that choice. Uh, yeah, my experience had been totally different um, because I, um, I I did not think about a job either in academia or in industry because I had two different paths in terms of education. I did my master's in pharmacy from India and there was a big gap in my uh, education uh, because it's due to transition to from India to US and then I, ha I had spent some time just working on some general product projects um, related to pharmacometrics um, by chance. So then I got interested in statistics. So I went and did a master's and PhD in statistics. So I have two different hats that I wear depending upon whom I speak to and even while introducing myself. So the academ academic job just landed, it looked like it landed in my lap because as I was finishing my PhD in statistics, um, there was an opening to teach pharmacometrics or statistics for pharmacometricians at University of Maryland. That was when the online program in pharmacometrics was started. So I just transitioned from a nearby university to the current university I'm in. So my path was completely different. I never thought I'll end up in academia, but over the past 10, 11 years, I have really started liking, I really like the interactions with the students and, and the kind of, um, and sometimes it's very gratifying to see that. So that, it's, it, that has been my experience. I think when I graduating from PhD is really opening opportunities wherever uh, it will lead me to. So um, my pre, I think my advisor's previous student works for Lilly and we have job openings and came to interview and got the job. I don't know, is it Rich Bergstrom here? I saw him. <laughs> yeah, and Rich Bergstrom. Uh, I was one of the, those that recruited me, so. And since then, enjoyed it, um, never left, never left the field. Um, this is just enjoyed the, the pharmaceutical industry from discovery and development um, that able to contribute that part, making medicines. It's just been a wonderful experience. Rich is there. I was just saying, uh, you recruited me, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for me, it even started before academia. So I had a contract with a bank to just get an education over there. And then during my civil service, I learned about academia to begin with. So this is even something where I had to come to academia by chance. And then I studied mathematics. And with mathematics, you also have a very broad spectrum to things you can go to. And um, eventually, I also ended up doing an internship. And um, I went on a website for biotech companies and I applied to the first five on this list. And Abbott at the time, ABB, was the first on the list. And so this is how I ended up in that company. Yeah. So in my case, it was a little bit um, complicated, but I never thought a lot about this. I never really planned. Um, like I said, uh, I'm from Spain and my background is a little bit different because I studied computer science and computer engineering. Um, there is not big pharma in Spain, so I always thought that probably uh, academia was my only path, but at the same time, I was like an outlier because, you know, I wasn't like a computer scientist and at the same time, I'm not a pharmacist, so it was something weird. Uh, but then I was forced to do a, a second postdoc in, in the U.S., so I came here in Indiana, I got stuck in Indiana, and, <laughs> and I started my career here in the U.S. in academia. Um, I didn't like it because it was more chasing money, but I, I have to tell you that if you do academia, for example, in Europe, it's, it's quite different. Um, then I jumped to industry, I really, really like it because um, in academia, I have the feeling that I was always late. You know, I was always modeling like all data and actually the decision was ma already made. So it was just modeling for modeling with zero impact. And when I moved to industry, this changed. So uh, I was very, very happy. And then I moved to uh, consulting with Metro. And, and I really like also uh, consulting. By the way, Metro is a fantastic, fantastic company. So... <laughs> They are always hiring, so I have a great, great experience. And then I went back to industry because um, I was kind of stupid, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm kind of happy. Uh, but my point is that 
whatever you do, you can change your mind anytime. So just follow your heart and try to enjoy your job. And if you are happy with your job, then you're going to be very, very successful. Maybe along the same lines of what uh, Nevis just said, I think you know life in general is about making choices, and I think you have a you, know, you have the option to make a choice to do something that you are really passionate about that you really like, and I think we're all fortunate because a lot of people on this planet you know don't have the luxury; they basically have to get up and you know do something that they absolutely hate, and that's not a good way to spend life. Um, and so there's you know obviously more things to be considered um, than you know only work choices. I mean, there's also you know private choices that you make and you know obviously your significant other has to be on the same page otherwise uh, you know if the harm you know the chemistry is not right at home you know it's not going to be right at work either and you know when i was growing up you know i was born and raised right at the interstate border in eastern germany and when somebody would have told me you know you're going to be a professor in the US one day he's like you know sure what are you taking you know must be good but uh, you know then life took its course you know i wanted to see how pharmacy started elsewhere and you know the reason i ended up in the u.s was not you know uf or because the program was great it was because of a girl you know and you know girls gone i'm still here so you know it's a you know life is about making choices yeah yeah no problem <laughs> it's, it's something about my last decision about moving to gilead it was actually because i changed my role like uh in management and I have to tell you that it's been a real, real pleasure, and I have my people right there, so they are fantastic. So it was a very so it's not only um, academia and industry, also in industry you have two parts. No, you, you can be also in management, and and it's been a wonderful experience. Very sweet, you know. And I think hopefully what you extracted from that is. Sometimes opportunities arise, and just go for it. And you might find that that's not the right opportunity for you. You know, Stefan did his his internship and said, no, it, uh, you know, industry is not for me. Uh, we have others who found their way into academia, and it, they found that they love it. And so there's opportunities for you. But open yourself up to those opportunities. Don't say, I only want to go to industry. I only want to go to consulting. I only want to go to academia. Check them out. And when you go to interview at these places, remember that you're also interviewing them. I think a lot of people forget that. They prepare very much for the interview and impressing their interviewer. But I want you to also make sure you're interviewing the company or the academic center or wherever it is that you're, you're looking at, finding out if that's right for you as well. Be and open your mind to, to opportunities. I'd like to see if there's any other. I have some seed questions here, but I'd much rather hear from you. So I'll ask really a follow-up question. Group. Yeah, please. Um, so I was going to ask, for those of us who don't know where our careers are going to take us, what might a transition look like from academia to industry or um, industry to academia? And what are some tips to navigate those transitions? Well, none of us know where our careers are going to take us. I was 20 years in uh, industry and I just went to consulting about less than a year ago. Um, but, you know, I know maybe Nieves, I want to give you the, the mic because you've transitioned in a couple of different ways from academia, industry and consulting. And now the way that I see it is that everything that I I have a big change in my life, professional and also at personal level, at the beginning is kind of scary, but I can tell you that once you start, and no matter the direction, once you start, um, then you are going to be very, very excited. So at the beginning, it's, it's going to be great. Actually, I will be more worried about what is going to happen after two years, because after two years, it's like your excitement is going down and blah, blah. But the transition, just the transition, I think is is awesome. It's a little bit more difficult just before and a little bit more difficult two or three years later. Yeah, I was saying the same thing. It's it's that moment before where you're going, am I making the right decision? Am I doing the right thing? And then there's when you start, there's the panic of learning everything that's new. I, I agree with you. Wait a couple of years and see, but give it a couple of years. Don't don't job hop. That's not, a, not good. Maybe a small remark to interviewing the company. Also, when you start the job, you can still go to people and ask questions. Is this how I am a, how I am supposed to do this? Can I do something different? So actively seeking for feedback on these things. So not just doing your thing, but if you are in a new environment, you have to learn. And the best thing is by asking questions and getting mentored. Yeah, just a quick comment to certainly transitioning from academic, getting your PhD 
to industry, it can be very different. Um, if you're doing the pharmacometrics work or whatever, technically maybe you are okay, but in the industry, especially, you know, I'm talking about big pharma, right? There's certain things set and very complex process in the discovery and the development. It's a highly regulated environment. So um, it can be overwhelming, but my advice is be open-minded and never stop learning. This is your opportunity to learn, ask questions, take the initiative, and then don't be shy. Oh, I don't want to ask a question because otherwise I'll be viewed as stupid or whatever. No, this is the best time for you to ask a question and learn, okay? Yeah, I think, um... I mean, we treating this as a binary choice, but I don't think it's like a binary choice. I mean, it's a continuum. Um, I think there's always perception matters, and there's a certain perception about academia. Now, I certainly went into this, and it's like, okay, you know, you know, one day when I'm a professor, I'm gonna sit in my office all day and doing research and writing papers, and you know, talk to my students about interesting science. Of course, I do that, but that's you know only a part of my job. And so I think the same is probably true for industry, um, where you say, okay, you know, I'm developing drugs all day. And so that's probably, you know, part of your job, of course. But there's a lot of like people management, you know, organizational things, you know, a bunch of committees uh, that, you, that you serve on. So I think there is, you know, a certain, to a certain extent, you can navigate this and kind of like, you know, kind of stack the odds in your favor a little bit, you know, as, as you go uh, through your career. So I, I don't think it's like, like an either or. There's also, at least as far as I'm concerned, uh, unless, I mean, you're really in a very rigorous, you know, tenure program where I said, okay, you have to get an R1 in order to get like tenured and promoted. There's nobody that tells you you cannot work with the private sector. I mean, and I, I personally love to work with the private sector or FDA because there's very applied questions. I think it's a great environment for students because they get, you know, exposed to the environment that they are likely going to work in and, you know, get used to the timelines and these sort of things. So so I think there's a couple of shades of gray in between. So it's not either or as far as I'm concerned. Um, along the lines of first jobs, so when you were in your first professional jobs, um, I think all of us have like, especially us coming from academia, like there's a very different environment for sure. Um, I would say even if you're transitioning from like an academic trainee to like a junior faculty position or something like that, or going to consulting, um, there's definitely a big learning curve. What is something that you wish that you had done differently or something that you're proud of yourself for doing in your first job that has influenced you up until now? That's an excellent question. Um, things that I wish I had done differently is not be afraid to ask the quote stupid questions. When you come to a new organization, whatever that is, we know, as the managers, we know you don't know everything. It's okay to not know everything. We didn't hire you because you knew everything. We hired you because we knew you had the potential. So don't suffer in silence. Don't sit at your desk saying, God, I wish I had an answer to this, but I know if I ask it, somebody's going to roll their eyes. I ask 150 stupid questions a day. Now, granted, I'm at that stage in my career where it's like, eh, what do I have to lose? I'm going to ask a stupid question. But honestly, you should feel the same way. You're there to learn and you're there to grow. And if you're sitting at your desk suffering in silence because you've promised to do some kind of analysis or some kind of project that you don't know how to do, everybody loses. The person you're doing the project for loses, you lose. So ask those stupid questions and ask them all the time. Now, there's a, there's a time and a place to ask a stupid question. Don't ask the CEO. Um, <laughs> but find a mentor, you know, find a, a colleague, talk to your manager if you're struggling with these kinds of things, but ask the questions because that's the way that you're going to learn and grow. And it's also going to show that you have the openness to ask those questions, particularly if you're working with colleagues. Like when I work with statisticians, I know I'm not a statistician, so I asked the dumb questions and that made them comfortable asking me questions about pharmacometrics as well. So opening that door when you ask those questions, I think really makes a big difference. Yes. So in my case, I can tell you that I regret nothing because I'm, I'm, yeah, because I'm the person that I am thanks to my mistakes. No, um, it's true that you know I regret nothing, but at the same time I learn from my mistakes. No, 
And for example, there are people that they might think that, you know, I wasn't very efficient in my career because first of all, I studied computer science, then I did the PhD in systems biology, then I did a first postdoc in public APD modeling, then a second postdoc in public APD modeling, then I, in academia, then I moved to industry. So it's not like very, very efficient, no? But I'm, I'm super happy that I did it. So, uh, so I don't care if it delay my career. I don't, I don't care at all. But the thing that I'm very, very proud is every time that I make a decision because sometimes, and this is a female thing, is that we have the tendency to overthink. And it's true that in the past, because I was overthinking and overthinking, by the time that I made the decision, it was too late. Um, so. But don't don't regret about your past. In, in any case, learn about your past. Yeah, I also have to say I'm quite uh, in agreement with myself, so I, I don't have bigger regrets. Um, I had to actually learn that I'm underthinking from time to time. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yes, and uh, this was very early in my career, so maybe it's not a professional thing, but there was a new colleague, and in Germany we have these things that you have the first name and last name, so you, you greet somebody with the first name if you're very close, and the last name if you're a bit more distant. And she was introducing herself and saying, can we talk to us in the first name? And I said, yes, that's okay. But once I have my PhD, we have to re renegotiate. <laughs> and she didn't laugh about that. She actually went to management and a few hours later, I had a date two levels higher than my boss. And um, this was something where I learned, sometimes you have to overthink a bit <laughs> um, and be a bit careful in what you're doing. Um, Nonetheless, I, I still think I'm, I'm somebody that likes to speak out and, and I, I get a bloody nose from time to time. It's okay if you can balance it out. So you don't overthink, but you don't underthink. Find find a balance and you should be good. Yeah, I don't think there's much of regret. Um, you know, enjoyed work, but a couple of perhaps tips. Um, I enjoyed, uh, I joined the Lily in the midst of heavy load of submission activity. And I was just thrown into, you know, here's the study, you do support. And I find this is the best for me, throw into my work, let me swim or sink, I'll learn from my mistake. And that's the best way for me to learn, all right? So that, that's one too, is um, along the way, you're going to make mistakes. Your work will be criticized, I quote, quote, this is nothing personal. Um, in a scientific environment, people, we want to criticize, right? We want scientific input and, and, and um, help us to be better. So do not take it as personal, okay? This is good for you. And it's good for everybody's to work. So you can be better. So that's what I'm keep saying is don't ever stop learning don't ever think I'm the best so that nobody criticize me or I take it personally. Um, this is actually is the way how you are going to be better. Um, another comment quickly is you're going to experience ups and downs in your, throughout your career. Uh, don't run away, all right? There are times one day or two days like, God, this is an awful place. I'm going to leave. My supervisor is, you know, whatever, right? And so actually confront it. You know, if there are issues, whatever, try to learn, try to be better. But also if you have issues, point it out, have a conversation. Don't constantly run away. Like I said, every three years, one year, I'm going to, you know, change a job just because I don't like that environment, okay? If you lose the passion, that's a different story, right? You want to explore something new, that's a different story. Just being say, hey, this is not working for me. I have to with my colleagues and supervisor. Don't run away from it. Yeah, to your question on specifically the academic transition, like when you're moving from um, a research fellow to a, a faculty, um, I, would, I mean, there's some two things I think I'm, I'm still learning in the process. So one is building a good network of uh, researchers, collaborators, trying to find out, identifying people whom you can, whom can work with early on would really help you in your academic career. The second thing is since 
we are all applied um, um, apply if you are in the applied field i mean i'm assuming you are uh, in the more technical pharmacometrician uh, I, I don't know what your background is but if you're a clinician that's well and good because clinicians know the problem where the problem is so we as quantitative scientists you can help solve them so uh, trying to ha have a good network of clinician collaborators is also helpful in the long run because when you write up grants you could have a good question and a good collaborator that's something i'm still learning and um yeah probably i will learn I mean, i'll find somebody really who can help with me so yeah yeah so also going back to your question i think no matter where you go i think it's important to pick a mentor um, it's okay to have like more than one mentor um you know also listen to your critics because the chances are uh, that's the ones that you learn the most from. And so, you know, don't be afraid to self-reflect. Have a look in the mirror. And, you know, as my favorite mo movie character, uh, uh, Lego Batman says, you know, if you want to make, make the world a, a, a better place, you know, have, have a look in the mirror and make, uh, make a change. So, so I think that that's important. Doesn't mean, of course, that you have to take, like, every bit of advice that you get and, you know, transform it into action. You know, take it as a piece of advice. And you cannot be the version 2.0 of someone. Neither should you try, you know. Make it your own, and chances are you develop over time. Um, and you know, don't try to live too much in the future or too much in the past. You know, try to smell the roses along the way. Otherwise, that's the recipe for midlife crisis. That's a great point. A couple of things that I pulled from that is um, something that Lan was saying: is feel your emotional responses, but don't act on them immediately. I mean, this happens a lot. Where let's say management makes a decision that you don't agree with. You can fly off the handle and you can go and complain about it or you take a breath. And I, I do this on a regular basis. If somebody says, what did you think about that? I've said, let me answer you in a couple of days. So they know that I'm not happy about it, but I want to, you want to really reflect on how you want to give that feedback. Um, and also in terms of giving feedback, ask for it all the time and also offer it all the time. Don't give it without asking if it's okay first, <laughs> but work with your colleagues on that. You know, give them feedback and ask for feedback because that's the only way that you're going to grow. And as as I think everyone here was saying, you might get feedback that you don't like, but learn from it and don't be defensive about it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wrote this down so I didn't forget it. What non-technical skills have you found to be most beneficial to your career success and how did you hone those skills? Well, Sam, let me answer the first one. Toastmasters, everybody. And I say this every year and Sam is going to be a new president of our MRG Toast Club at, at Metrum. Toastmasters and, and working on your communication skills, particularly for technical people, the most important thing that you can do. Because if you are talking, you know, if you're talking to us, that's a different story. If you're talking to the CEO, you're talking to the chief medical officer or the project team, and you're up there showing them diagnostic plots and walls of numbers and FOCE with interaction, guess what? They're out. So really being able to extract what did you do, summarize what you did, why it's important and why they care is such a huge, huge, huge important thing. And it's not something you're going to learn how to do overnight work with a coach, join Toastmasters, work with your manager. That probably is 90% of the reason for my success. I'm a decent modeler, okay? You know, I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm not the best. I'm not the worst. But what really brought me further along was the communication skills and really working on that. And I've been in Toastmasters for 20 years and, and strongly recommend it to everybody. You knew I was going to say that. I probably, th thank you. Thank you for asking that question, Sam. Well, I think, you know, key to success is, you know, keep your curiosity, you know, keep an open mind, uh, you know, ask questions and, you know, try to put yourself uh, in somebody else's shoes uh, every once in a while. And, you know, don't jump the gun too quickly, you know, don't take yourself too seriously, take your job seriously. And so, um, because, you know, if you do that, and, you know, try to get to know people to know on a, on a personal basis, because that, you know, prevents situation where somebody looks at you like, you know, Crooked-eyed, and then said, "Okay, you know that person must be mad at me for like you know the rest of my career." Probably, you know, something happened. You know, that's completely out of your control. Um, and if you know somebody on a personal level, it's like, all right, you know, he's just having a bad day, so you know, we'll be friends tomorrow. Uh, yeah, something on the same lines as what Stefan said, but uh, one non-technical skill would be like 
um, how to start a conversation with somebody whom we want to reach out and talk. And then um, trying to build upon some people like to start a little bit more personally. Some people would like to speak about sports. So those skills, it's, it's an evolving skill. So you need to know whom to talk to and what. So th having that, trying to develop that skills would come a long way and it will help in networking. As we all professionals, we have to network with people, work with people together. So that's one, one thing, yeah, I would say. I think <clears throat> if you look at job posting, a uh, big, big one communication, uh, teamwork, right? So for technical people, we often talking about jargons and modeling, and you can't communicate to with your senior leadership when we're making a big decision of what dose and you know why is it and how how did you do that, right? So it's it's so important to you know your audience and then how you communicate, right? So that's one, too, is also listen. You're willing to listen when you are supporting a project, a team. Uh, don't be too, how do I say it, um, defensive. Um, statistician. You know, I know pharmacometric statistician, a lot of times we kind of are butting heads. Um, willing to listen, get their input, and then try to explain collaboration. That's so important in that case, if you can pull a statistician on your side, you can pull a medical uh, personnel on your side to support your idea. It becomes so important when it comes down to the impact. Um, the third one is network, uh, networking. Um, I'm not talking about, oh, just a good relationship and everything is based on that. If you know the person, you build that trust, it's a lot easy that you work together. Yeah, it's tough to add anything to that, but I would also say assume good intent. So this is something that gets me through the day. So it may be wrong 5% of the time, but it is right 95% of the time. There's nobody out to get you. Everybody wants to do a good job, wants to do what he's doing the best way he can. So just approach things with an open mind and assuming everybody's just there to, to do their best and help each other. Um, so in my case, Sam, uh, is be yourself. Uh, don't pretend to be somebody else because you want to fit or because, you know, this is the, the way that this company work or whatever. Just be yourself, your authentic yourself. And I am uh, a true believer of diversity and inclusion. And every time that I'm talking about diversity, actually what I really mean is that, you know, all of us, we are different, with different backgrounds, different personalities. Uh, there is nothing wrong, so just be yourself and don't pretend, please. I love that. I think for many of us, we've made our way in our career by being our own goofy self, and it's worked for me, so recommend it for all of you. Other questions? I, I'm going to add to the previous conversation about no stupid questions. Um, imposter syndrome is real. Um, I'm not going to ask, but I'm going to suspect that most of the people sitting up there have had imposter syndrome at least once in the last month. You don't get over it. You never get over it. I hope you don't get over it. Getting over it means that if you don't think that at some point there's something you ought to know or you think someone thinks you ought to know that you don't know, it means you stop trying to grow and you're just sitting there in your comfort zone. Um, don't do that. Um, everyone has it. Um, and if you're sitting in a room and you don't know what's going on, realize that everyone else is faking it too. It's not just you. 100%, Mark, thank you. I think, I mean, I, don't, I raised my hand. I didn't turn around. I know that, that, that I've suffered from it. And, and I like your point and it sort of comes back to my stupid questions. Someone's going to be really relieved that you asked it. Because about, about 10 people, out of 12 people in the room, 10 people are wondering the same thing. And they're going to be like, Boy, am I glad that she asked that question. I didn't want to ask it. And again, that opens up. But you're you're totally right. Imposter syndrome is real. But, you know, don't underthink it. Don't overthink it. But have some confidence in yourself and, and give it a try. What's going to happen if you fail? You're going to learn. Thank you, Mark, because actually my comment is highly correlated with that. So uh, if you are yourself and you are proud of yourself, then you don't have to pretend, so you don't, you are not going to suffer this imposter syndrome. So there are a lot of things that I don't know, 
and I'm not ashamed for that. So mine developed over time, but fake it till you make it is a good one too. I have a story in a minute. Yeah, I think, you know, at the same time, it's an opportunity to grow. And sometimes it's as, you know, simple as, you know, since we are working oftentimes in interdisciplinary teams, where everybody speaks like a slightly different language and English is usually not the challenge. You know, if you speak to a mathematician or a clinician or a statistician, sometimes just seeking clarification is like, you know, what I heard you say was like X, Y, and Z. Did I hear this correctly? And then when, you know, people say, okay, no, that's actually not what I meant. That's just, you know, what you heard me say. And then you know, see, uh, provide some clarifications like, oh yeah, no, I've been thinking about this along the same lines, just from a different angle. So that you know, oftentimes helps quite a bit. So, Mark, you you asking that question reminds me of many, 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 many years ago when I was the chair of the AAPS focus group for modeling and simulation, and I put myself as the moderator for all these sessions, including one one with you, Mark. And I asked all of the speakers for questions to ask. So I'm up here with people like Mark and Nick Holford. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about, but guess what I did? I asked very smart questions. Fake it till you make it. I became associated with all of these folks. My point in saying that, not to out myself, but I just did, but it's also to say, put yourself out there, you know, take chances, moderate sessions, volunteer for stuff, you know, get involved in AAPS and, and, and ISOP and, and ASCPT and all of these other organizations get on these committees, start volunteering, because that's also a way to increase your visibility and to increase your uh, association with very, very smart people. And then you become associated with very smart people, and then they think you're a very smart person, and then you become a very smart person. So these things will happen. Fake it till you make it, and I like to think I made it, but part of that has started just putting myself out there. And I really want to encourage all of you to consider that as a step in your career, it's not about your job itself, but it's about putting yourself out in professional development opportunities and volunteering with organizations. It's an excellent, excellent way. I know, Ben, you've been involved in things, and so so many people in this room. It's a really, really great way to put yourself out there and start getting some visibility for you. And I think probably everybody here has done something like that in their past. Do you want to talk about kind of external opportunities beyond your job that have really helped you in your career? Um, sure. Maybe maybe just to, to go back to, you know, like the point that you raised before that really quick, and that is, it it's okay not to know everything. I mean, nobody knows like everything. Um, and, and it's it's okay to say, you know, I don't know. And, you know, usually people don't, you know, but, but particularly if they, you know, if you come out of a program and you're looking for a first job, uh, as, you know, we said, you know, nobody's expecting you to um, to know everything. But I think what people are looking for is, the, the aptitude and the, the attitude that you have towards like thinking about a problem, addressing a problem. And if you, if you can figure it out on your own in, a, in, in your basement on a Sunday afternoon, you know, God bless. If you figure it out talking to your teammates, that's also great, right? I mean, the important point is that you take a step towards, um, you know, providing a solution. Um, it doesn't have to be the best solution on the planet, but it has to be at least a solution on how to address it that you can put on the table for discussion. Um, in terms of uh, what you can do, you know, outside of your regular job, um, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think you know, we all think about like Toastmasters and, you know, you know, other things that are kind of like along the lines of what we are doing. Um, I oftentimes put myself into situations where I don't know the first thing about stuff. So that's completely perpendicular to what my comfort zone is. So to look at this as a, you know, opportunity to grow, I don't know build like a cabinet or, you know, fix the electric or, you know, do whatever, uh, just to kind of do something else to, to broaden your horizon. You also get like a little, you know, ease of mind sometimes, and then, you know, be able to, to refocus on what you're supposed to do during your day job. Um, that would be my, my five cents. Um, yeah. Um, I would probably say, I mean, all, always have to have like what he exactly said about to have a hobby, which you really like, which you really love to do. Uh, because um, for me, cooking is, though it is a lot of work, I do like cooking because I have to cook for my family, but, but it's also something I really enjoy. But those are the times that my thoughts are like really fresh and I get so many research thoughts and research ideas during my cooking. So always have a hobby, which 
where you relax your mind, which relaxes your mind. It doesn't have to be any, I mean, maybe just staring also sometimes helps, but but have something which you're really passionate and you like doing it. And then that frees up your mind and it kind of stimulates other thoughts. That's uh, that probably many of us do, but I just wanted to put it out. Yeah, maybe mm. my interpretation outside of your core job. So outside of your core job, that's meaning outside of your Eli Lilly's project or whatever, right? And then there's external uh, activities, professional activities that you can involve. Yes, ASCPT, metrics, um, you know, volunteer, get yourself involved. It's part of you can networking. Um, learn um, and mentoring others as well. Um, in industry, I'm sure you know many of of the company has internship program or whatsoever, and then you can get involved and take a student under your wing, help them to learn. Um, so those are kind of things outside of your, your job, but it's professional. I'm right? um, certainly I agree. Uh, completely outside of your your job is you know some do something else. Um, if you love tennis, golf, swimming, hiking, traveling, you know do that. That that really helps relax, energize, press button. It's important. Yeah, I'm also looking forward to bike to work work again in spring. So in shape again and uh the other thing is also um events like this one here so this is also something that maybe i'm regretting a bit from my past so i have been very focused on my app internal jobs doing presentations internal at app but in the recent years i learned that i also want to go more to conferences symposia meeting with people getting out there seeing what others are doing so this is something that i also changed myself with. So I'm with the company now for 18 years or so, and this is something I, I adopted recently, going out there and meeting with people. And yeah, something you can do. Okay, my guess is a very easy answer. So it's City Size Symposium, come here every year and you are going to see. <laughs> um, you know, I was involved in the City Size Symposium from the very beginning with Robert Bees, and actually, uh, you know, it's a very small conference, so you have the opportunity to talk to people I like, really, really talk, not, not like in ACOP that, you know, they are not going to remember, remember your face. Uh, for example, I met officially Stacy here, and now she's sleeping in my house, so. <laughs> so <laughs> different, different rooms, different rooms, eh? But no, but seriously, um, I met so many people in this conference and have the opportunity to have dinner with them and spending quality time with them. So these kind of small conferences, they are super, super useful. And like I said, come every single year, please. I really love how they took a bit of a left turn on this because I think that is really important. Uh, and I see you, I will hand you the... One back there and then one here. Just just real briefly to, to say that, you know, look for leadership opportunities where you can find them. I think a lot of people think, well, I can't be a manager because I have no leadership experience. You can get a ton of leadership experience, both professional development as well as things like P PTA and your kids scout troop and, and your religious organization. There's lots of different ways for you to build leadership experience and to build that into your CV to show that you can plan things, that you can do time management, that you can do resource management. These are all leadership skills that you you learn. You also get them in Toastmasters, just saying. But these are definitely different ways for you to be able to build leadership. If you can't get that in your company and in your particular career ladder, there's ways to to achieve that uh, in, in many other ways, both through your per, your personal habits, your personal habits, your uh, uh, hobbies, as well as, as you know other things that you do professionally. The question back here. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask this, uh, uh, since we've been encouraged to ask questions, and some of us, this might be our last time coming here because we are in our last year. And and so um, one of the most important things for us now is find a job. It's not, <laughs> and that's not because we just want a job, it's because we want to apply what we know yeah. uh, to be able to apply it. And so uh, one of the things that we've been encouraged to do is to network. And so we go to workshop, we come to a place like this. That vi the question I have is um, meeting very important people like people on the stage. How do you bring up something like that? How do you 
how do you uh, maybe indirectly or directly ask for a job, see if they're hiring? Great, great question. Well, first, be direct. Come up, meet us anytime. Please don't be afraid to walk up to somebody and say hello. At, particularly here, it's nice because it's small, but even in the really large conferences, if you don't know someone and you're a little shy, someone you know, your mentor or someone can introduce you. But really, don't be shy. Nobody bites, I think, <laughs> here. Um, and you know, don't necessarily go up and say, hi, I'm looking for a job, but go and say, I'm I'm in the last year of my postdoc and this program, and I'm, I'm looking into career opportunities. Could you tell me a little bit about your company and, and what you do? Do you happen to be hiring? Because sometimes we're not, but we can certainly say, oh, I'm not, but let me introduce you to Nieves. Let me introduce you to Sven. They're they're hiring over at, at their company. So you know, I wouldn't necessarily go up and be like, hi, can you give me a job? But but certainly walk up, introduce yourself, be interested in their company, tell us a little bit about you, have your little elevator pitch ready about who you are and what your interests are, and just ask, you know, ask about our career, and then we'll we'll be able to help you. But don't be shy. I think that's the most important thing, and I know that this is present company accepted, generally an, uh, an introverted type of, of, of group just because of, of the nature of what we do. But people, we want to help. We want to talk to trainees. We want to help trainees. We want to help propagate this discipline that we all love. So us helping you is also helping us. Please don't be shy. Come up and talk to any of us. Um, well, I guess couple of suggestions. Uh, suggestion number one, you know, don't sit with your friends at a lunch table. Uh, you know, go, you know, sit at a table where you don't know anybody and, uh, you know, take this as an opportunity to have to have a conversation and learn about something about each other. And, you know, you learn that somebody likes diving. That's great. You know, it's a great conversation starter for the, for the next, you know, go around. Number two is, um, I think, check your assumptions. Um, again, you know, you know, if you say, okay, these people don't want to talk to me, I mean, if that were, what was the case, I guess we probably wouldn't be here, right? I mean, because, you know, I mean, obviously we have an interest to share our experience, our thoughts, and, you know, talk to you, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So if it's just say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't want to approach them because they probably don't want to talk to me, you know, probably not the best assumption to make. Um, you know, in case things, you know, don't work out and transition directly in a career opportunity, and we, you know, we had this uh, situations, don't assume that you're like not not good enough, or you know that something went wrong, or that the the personal chemistry is not right. Because you don't know the whole picture, you know sometimes maybe there's you know other applicants, there's competing offers, maybe there's a, like a timeline issue, there's a visa issue, you know whatever. So uh, and you know this is not it's not a sprint, right? It's it's a marathon. So you know try to build you know relationships over the long haul, and you know if you can't come together you know today, then you know maybe in two years from now. And number four, you know, don't burn bridges. It's a small world. Uh, don't burn bridges. I, I mean, I think this has been well said. I don't have anything else to add. Yeah, the same thing. I think, you know, to, to sign, I, I think we are most of it all, us are uh, introverted. Um, and so, but, you know, if you're looking for a job or whatever you need to do, we're willing to put yourself out there. Right. Introduce yourself, have a conversation when you go to conference or workshops, um, network with people. And I'm sure, you know, ask for, hey, would you mind, you know, give me your email and I would like to follow up with you. And many of us and most of us are very open to do. Um, if you go for an interview, things didn't pan out, sometimes may ask any feedback. Did I, what did I do good? Or if there's skill set, experience that I'm lacking, and like I said, we'll be open minded if for some reason it, this is just not your time to find a job in industry and be open to a postdoc, right? Um, to academic, a fellowship, whatever. I mean, just be open for all part of the learning and. Yeah, so I have not much to add to that. But when it comes to the CV, for example, maybe the, to the earlier thing in communication, so know your audience and what they are looking for in a CV. So make it easy for us to read the CV, put the important thing first, don't overdo it, 
And a lot of people forget to list their technical skills, which is always very uh, interesting for me to see that they did all this mixed effect modeling, R training, Pumas, whatever, and they forget to put it in the CV or they put it in the very end. And if you're applying for a pharmacometrics position, this is one of the key competencies. So make it visible and make it easy for us to, to see what kind of expertise you bring. So I'm repeating myself, but uh, if you're doing an interview, please be yourself. Don't pretend. Enjoy the moment. This is the most important part. Enjoy the the, the interview uh, because then they are going to know. And, and another thing that I want to say is that if you are also apply to the jobs that you are really interested in. So for example, uh, if you are more for a clinical pharmacology role, but you think that uh, because you are seeing pharmacometrics in your CV, it's going to be for you easier to get the job. But at the same time, you know, in your mind is that as soon as I can, I'm going to jump to clinical pharmacology. Please don't, don't do that. If you want to go to pharmacometrics, go to pharmacometrics. If you want clinical pharmacology, clinical pharmacology. But yeah, don't try to fool yourself and fool others. Okay, we have time for one more. Um, to get a flavor of your careers and lifestyle, I'm wondering if you can discuss like a day of your life and perhaps touch upon the highs and lows of that day or maybe your career. Wow, that, that's going to be a bit... Do we have time for that? <laughs> maybe just brief or... I would just want to also want to note that I think there is a mentoring... Is the, is the lunch... I don't know where Sarah is. Is the lunch tomorrow? So we're also going to have an opportunity to go table to table with a bunch of mentors. So I, I don't want to cut people off, but you know we might keep it short. I'm going to skip this one because I'm not doing pharmacometrics anymore. I'm doing more business development and scientific engagement at the company. So I'll let some of our day-to-day -day folks. Uh... Um, you know, this is a loaded question, really. And um, you know, I'm going to preface my answer with saying that um, I consider myself really fortunate that I can do for a living what I like doing. And so it's not like oh, like too much of a burden. I mean, obviously there is a balance between things. Um, so, but you know, if if you want me to be specific, I usually get up between five and five thirty. Um, then I usually exercise for like an hour before my kids get up. Then I make breakfast and lunch for them, uh, take them to school. Uh, so usually I'm at work, you know, by eight o'clock. You know, sometimes I'm in the office at four. You know, if deadlines are there. Um, so, um, then usually have back-to-back -back meetings from like nine to five. Um, so that's why I also don't like particular emails, um, you know, because that is an extra thing. That's why I call it Pandora's e-box. Um, and then you basically going home and then I make a purposeful attempt to not be on the phone, not be on emails for the next three hours because it's, you know, family time, unless hell freezes over, I'm, I'm there with my kids. And then, you know, if I have to do things afterwards, then this is what I do. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, when I need to get things done, I block my calendar because uh, otherwise, you know, it doesn't get done. And whatever happens, you know, this is going to get done. Otherwise, um, you know, it's not happening. And my attention usually comes in waves because I'm really good at focusing really hard on one thing at a time. And I'm not a good multitask and I'm not trying to pretend. You would still like to know the day to day how it goes. Uh, yeah. It's a typical day. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I mean, in academia, um, I think there is a lot of flexibility. So, um, I mean, there are meetings in a typical day. There are going to be meetings, research meetings. But I tend to, the one thing um, I try to do is like to meet with students, I tend to fix a day so that. I go over them, discuss with them what they were doing, what what kind of um, um, uh, issues that they come up with. So it's like I I kind of fix my days to or block my days for re meeting with graduate students and other meetings. I try to schedule in such a way that the work can get get done efficiently. So not each day is not typical, but sometimes it may become too um, uh, too cumbersome. But just tr I try to kind of plan the days so that it can be spent efficiently. So that's kind of, and but academia gives that flexibility of 
um, at least I, I'm, I'm lucky, I have to say I'm lucky as well, that um, it gives me flexibility to have some time in the morning for my family and time in the evening for my family so that um, you can balance both work life. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> more of it about industry. I think if you say this is the nine to five job, that's not going to work, all right? Uh, if you think weekend, definitely no way I'm going to work. That's not going to work. Um, be flexible. I think most of the company right now also try to protect um, the outside of a working hour. But when there are project needs that you need to do it, you, know, you just need to do it. We've got in the past people working in midnight uh, when the data comes because that's a critical part. Right, you have to do it, but um, it's not every day like that. But you need to be flexible and then get job done. Uh, that's what it is. Can I go off a little bit, just a little bit? Um, with the COVID, a lot of people are talking about oh, working from home. Okay, and I'm going to say that, especially when you are just starting your job. Um, if you said, I'm going to be working from home remotely, you know, in Alaska, Hawaii, um, when you just start in a job, it's not going to work, at least from my perspective. Okay, so you need to think about that because it's not good for your career development. It's not good for your learning. Um, so... Keep that in mind. Now, certainly there are things that you've got to do career, whatever. You just need to make that choice. Yeah, to that point, actually, we are located in Germany. And I, as much as my budget allows, I'm sending people over here to be in the office, to connect with people, because you work much better together if you are present, if, if you see a person's reaction, if you feel it. If you go to lunch, if you have some beers in the afternoon, uh, evening, uh, um, so this is really something that that is also helping us, and um, yeah. So and and you can have the flexibility, but there are demands. If if Japan needs something in a week or so, and this still has to be translated, you have to work to get it done. So it goes to the translation and everything. So there are ups and downs, um, but overall, I'm 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 happy where I am and uh, yeah, doing well. Yeah, uh, following the topic about working from home or in on site. Um, in my case, I'm working from home and it's true that when you are uh, starting your career, it's super, super important to be on site. Um, at this point of my career, I don't think it's super, super important because first I have the longest name in the company. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody is able to recognize the name. I have a very thick accent and I'm very, very loud. So, um, so it's, in my case, it's fine. But um, yeah, it's true that I usually get up at 7.30 and at 7.31, I'm already in front of my computer. But yeah, I have a filter for my Zoom camera. So, um, and then um, this is something that I don't feel very proud, but I have to be honest, I spend a lot of, I have a lot of work and at the same time we have a lot of meetings. And a lot of meetings and actually multitasking, that means that I'm doing modeling and just waiting for my name, so I'm not really listening. Um, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's my way of multitasking, so I'm, I'm limited. So, um, but yeah, um, we have a lot of work, but it depends uh, every day, but I will say that is 50% or no, it's more than 50 uh, meetings and then um, also hands-on work. And also my favorite, favorite, favorite part of the job is meeting with my people and, and discussing models and doing the, you know, the science. So, yeah. Okay, did we freak you out, you guys? Um, I think the, the important take-home message from this is Everybody's gonna work on their own time, but you need to work on time and resource management. A big part of it is being flexible, but also setting those boundaries is really important. And as you're starting a new job, setting those boundaries and saying, here's time that I have to spend with my kids. I'm unable to take meetings and don't, it's gonna be a time, but whenever you can, don't budge and really try to stick with those boundaries, particularly if you're working at home. I think those are really important to set those boundaries for yourself as well 
to, to unplug. I think a lot of people who are working modeling think we're modeling 100% of the time. Uh, you know, if it's a pie chart, maybe it's like that much of the pie chart. A lot of it is scoping and talking to teams and going to meetings and things. Hopefully they're productive meetings and they're meetings where you're talking about understanding the problem and, and scoping and planning and things like that. But, you know, be prepared for that. Um, but set your boundaries and time box some of these things like checking emails and things, you know, to make sure that you're really doing what you were hired to do. Yeah, um, you know, may, maybe as a, as a final comment, uh, make sure you have like sufficient downtime uh, because, I mean, you cannot be on full speed like all the time, right? So make sure you're not like, you know, always like in a, you know, in the in the right in terms of RPM, you know, do something else that, that is fun. Uh, maybe also, you know, you're not the first person that thinks about like time management, you know, there's professional courses, audiobooks and stuff out there, where you have to structure your day in terms of, you know, quadrants and what to delegate and what to do yourself. So there's nothing wrong with like seeking also like, you know, professional advice on, on how to structure a day. You don't have to say yes to like everything all the time, uh, but make sure, you know, you have to just chance to recharge batteries in between. So I know we're a little bit over time. I just want to thank very much our panel and thank all of you who asked questions. This was really great. I learned some new things and uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us or to see us tomorrow during the mentoring lunches and, and you know, rotate towards our tables if you want to hear more. And thank you to all of you for your attention.